Hi, I'm Jerry Levinson, and this is the Flooring Business Podcast, where each week we talk to expert flooring dealers, suppliers, marketing experts, software experts, and anyone I believe is going to help you in your flooring business. My mission is to give you good information that will help you reach your goals. If you're just starting your business, trying to reach $5 million in sales, or you're ready to sell your business, you're going to find the information helpful to reach your goals and profit now in the flooring industry. Remember, each Thursday offers sales training that'll be good for your entire team. That's only one fifty per month, and it'll more and pay for itself over and over again as I show you ways to close more sales at higher prices. Now, in this week's episode, I've got our friend, friend to the industry, Todd Saunders, and um, everybody knows who Todd is. And rather than a full-on introdu- introduction, I want Todd to give us a little background and just to let you guys know the reason I'm interested in, in um, interviewing Todd today is as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, this isn't done to solicit uh, Broadloom and uh, Floor Force and any other brands that they're offering. Um, but, you know, I'm fascinated by Todd. I always have been in, in what drives him and some of the things he does that I'll get into that, um, has always impressed me. So Todd, can you give us a, a little bit of background, um, especially like how you went from Google, a good secure job with benefits to starting your own company ad hoc. Yeah. Um, and then, and then how you decided to specialize in flooring. Yeah. It's funny. I gave that speech at, um, at, FloorCon about how I, how I got into it. And I won't get into all the details, but um, we do have an upcoming um, town hall on the 23rd of March, where I'm actually going to tell the full story. So if you want all the details, tune in for that March 23rd. (laughs) But um, how I got into the flooring industry is, is a, is a common question. So I started my career at Google. I was on the ads team at Google and I knew day one, hour one, Google wasn't for me. Uh, I am a big I like the ability to work my ass off and get rewarded for how hard I work. And, and the, you know, if, if you, if you work really, really hard and make, get a ton of output, well, I want to be rewarded like that. And that wasn't necessarily the vibe that Google paid off. I mean, Google is a $60,000. Wow. Let me start over a 60,000 person. <laughs> they're more than 60,000, a 60,000 person organization. And after two years, you're level one. After three years, you're level two. After four years, you're level four. And that type of hierarchy, just as a young, driven person, just wasn't doing it for me. It wasn't getting me motivated every day. So I knew day one, like this wasn't for me. I wanted the unlimited upside. If I worked unlimited hours and did unlimited output, I wanted to be able to grow as fast as I could grow. So for two years, I was trying to figure out what our exit strategy was. I met um, Dan, my co-founder there. Uh, He had come to Google after exiting his startup. And... About two years into Google, we started applying to technology accelerators. Uh, So what a technology accelerator is, is you go in with a business idea and they surround you with great mentors and kind of 90 days after the accelerator, you kind of go and build your business. And the biggest, the two biggest ones in the tech space are Y Combinator and Techstars. So you join those as like um, a team of one or two and you kind of incubate or you accelerate and you come out of there, you pitch to investors and you raise some money and then you're kind of off to the races to build your business. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting concept I've toyed around with in the flooring industry. But anyway, hmm. that happened in 2015, quit my job. We got into one of these, you know, really prolific tech accelerators, um, did the accelerator for 90 days, still didn't really know what we were doing, but launched an advertising technology company. I think that was in our blood. That was really easy for us. And it was authentic for us, right? Because we came from Google. We talked about advertising technology every single day at Google. So to launch an advertising technology company, like we just knew it so well. We were passionate about it at the time that it just came, you know, kind of second nature. Fast forward. Target audience then, who are you? Everyone. Anyone that needed digital advertising. We basically looked at digital advertising like um, trading stocks where, there's high frequency trading algorithms and there's all these things to help people trade stocks. But on the digital marketing side, imagine if you have the same technology and could build your own mutual fund of 
uh, digital advertising. So we can move your money around from Facebook to Twitter to Google to Pinterest all in real time. And you just manage a top level budget and we move it all around. That was kind of the concept. Let me ask you this question. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves a little bit because this is a really important part. Um, target uh, advertising um, at that point, were you starting to see some of the benefits of you know, maybe selecting a target audience versus going after everyone? Or, or was there any kind of fear about selecting a, a specific target audience? Um, are you asking when it comes to digital advertising or asking as we as running the business? Because I actually think the more interesting answer is how we ran the business. Like we ran the business targeting every type of customer. If you spent less than $5,000 on digital advertising, you were our customer. Um, the difference today is if you are a flooring retailer, you are our customer. And those that segmentation goes from whatever, 15,000 retailers to whatever, 100 million small businesses or however many small businesses there are, are you know, globally. Um, it is night and day, the difference of our business, talking to one persona versus talking to a million personas. When we were ad hoc, we were something generic for a lot of different industries and a lot of different personas of people, we couldn't speak, we tried to speak all their languages. So we spoke digital advertising. Now that we're just focused on one persona, the retailer of the flooring industry, we can speak flooring, we can speak their language and we can get involved in the things they get involved in. And it has made our marketing, our sales, our approach way, way, way easier. Uh, so if I could have done it over again, I probably would have started an advertising technology business focused on one very specific vertical. And I think where you're kind of going with this is like, maybe that's a, a learning exercise for retailers where who is your customer? Don't try to be everything to everyone. Don't try to appeal to the massive builder and the $200 million home and the $200,000 home, right? Can you really carve out your niche and do really, really well at your niche? still take in a little bit of business here and there, but focus on what you're really good at and talk to that really specific customer. It hammers home way better than trying to talk to everyone. And that's what we found going from targeting all SMBs and all businesses to really building software for just flowing retailers. Yeah. And that's really a hard concept for people to wrap their head around because who's your target audience? Well, I would argue it's your, you know, 45 to 65 year old uh, female uh, it, it, and even the industry shows that with uh, men or are part of making the decision, but I would argue it's the woman who finds out which store that they're going to shop at. So that to me is who we are marketing to. Yeah. You can slice and dice it so many ways, right? Like even today I say we're, we work with flooring retailers. Well, then you have, are you working with $2 million flooring retailers? You're working with 20 million, you're working with hundred million. So something we do in our business, and this is going a little bit off, off uh, kilter from uh, kind of how we got there, but something we do in our business is we have what's called battle cards. And if we're talking to a dealer that's a million dollar dealer who just started their showroom, we have a different conversation and mm -hmm. different script and different retort. If we know we're talking to someone who is a $10 million dealer with five locations, it's a different conversation. If we're talking to a hundred million dollar dealer, it's a different conversation. We know they're different retorts and we know that they have different pain points. So mm -hmm. We try to categorize each person we talk to into a persona and based on that persona, give them the best conversation or best experience um, or best explanation of our products. All right. Well, how that ties in with our audience here is the battle card concept is something they can do. If you want to have a commercial division or somebody that's going after a real estate agents, um, you can have them specifically focus on that and be experts in that. You know, you might have a team of six or seven salespeople and uh, you can have them go after specific verticals so they can have that conversation the, the right way and really understand that that vertical, that niche. Yeah. And I'm, I'm taking this. I'm going to keep going with this concept. Um, a lot of people know that we launched a retail selling system, right? That's part of our, our platform. We have our website platform, our CRM platform, our flooring software. Um, and now we have a retail selling system that kind of connects the online experience to the in-store experience. Um, very similarly to how I believe you need to run your business, we built that retail selling system. So a quarter of the selling system goes after people that are looking for um, 
you know, a consumer that walks in and says, hey, I'm looking, I have a rental property and I'm looking for um, something that I can replace every few years. And I've got, a, you know, two kids and five dogs. Um, another portion of the selling system is someone that comes in and says, I have a $3 million house and I want to put in, you know, beautiful floors that'll last me a lifetime. A different part of the selling system is someone that comes in and says, I'm a designer. I want something fashion forward. I believe, and our team believes that the showroom should be based on persona. So you should have four corners based on the persona of the person rather than the type of flooring, like hardwood section and a carpet yeah. section and a vinyl blank section. And I can go into why, but I think that ties back into why I left Google and, and why focusing on a specific persona and keeping them within that story is, is important. No, it's a lot of fun discovering this stuff and, and exploring it. Um, in, in what you're talking about, it's, it's something I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but you know, I've always said that, you know, we are in the industry is so married to product and they do segment it by product. And we're really in the people industry. And I, I agree. That was my vision. When I set up our showroom is, is to let's have the wood flooring next to the very rich carpet, you know, and, and let's, let's put products together based on, on people and how they're going to buy it, not based on what the product is. Yep. I, I would argue that we're all in the service business. I mean, I probably will go with some of this conversation is I am all over Facebook. I am all over email. I'm all over text. I'm, I want to be the most reachable person in the flooring industry. Um, I want our team to be the most reachable people in the flooring industry, because I believe that no matter you're a software company, you're a flooring manufacturer, you're a retailer, we're all in the service business and we're all trying to give our customers the absolute best consumer experience or retailer experience, whatever, customer experience. And at the end of the day, what's most forgotten is just people to people responses, honesty, right? Um, genuine responses that are quick and honest, like that doesn't happen anymore. And I think you can stand out in whatever you do by having that mindset. You know, it's funny, uh, I get challenged from time to time about me supporting you and in, in what you're doing and, and you, you guys paying me to do what I do. And <laughs> I'm like, well, we've never exchanged a dime. <laughs> and not only that, I've never recommended you you're just always on the forum and you're oh. vocal. And I said, you know, I've invited the other people to come on. They have just as much ability to be vocal. You're reachable. Not only that, I have never taken down a post that attacked you guys if it was fair. And you have never asked me to. Yeah. I have never gotten an email from anybody saying, hey, will you remove that? You know, I think the only time I did, and, and somebody, uh, Debbie, complained about it because somebody basically made a personal attack on you, which I won't allow. Yeah, listen, uh, we retailers, manufacturers, I'll speak, when I say we as problem, I think anyone can take that as we as their company. No one's perfect. Right? Like we, we cannot be perfect for everyone. We make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. So part of being genuine and honest is I think there are some people that our software won't work for. There's some people who don't like, um, you know, carpets of Arizona and you guys installed it wrong or just had a bad experience or bad communication. That's, that's real, right? Like I tell retailers all the time, okay, you have 500 five-star reviews and five one-star reviews. Why are you worried about getting rid of the one-star reviews? They feel genuine. Like people have bad days and things happen. That's just how it works. But 98% of the time you do it right. And I like to think us at our company, 98% of the time, we do it right as well. So I try to, any negative post or anytime there's frustration on the forums, I'm the first one on there. First one to get my phone number. And a lot of times it's just a communication problem and we get it solved in like two seconds or sometimes really it's our fault and we own it and we do our best to, to make it right. I mean, it's no different than you guys, right? I mean, than retail. Oh yeah. Right? No, I've always said problems are opportunities and you know, what really people dislike the most is the lack of communication. You could screw up on their job. That's fine. And they might be upset in the beginning, but they're really going to be pissed off if you don't communicate well. Or you don't take ownership or you blame other people. Like we take ownership. We do what's right. We try to be super fair. Um, for us, reputation is much more important than a few dollars here and a few dollars there. 
Um, and I'm sure that's how the industry feels doing their work as well with customers. Yeah. And that is, it, that's one of my things I was going to ask you about too, is follow-up, which you're great at. Um, and, you know, I always admire the fact that and appreciate it that you are every now and then every four or six weeks, I get something, a, a, a message from you. Hey, Jerry, how you doing? <laughs> you know? And, you know, with no agenda in mind, nothing, you just reach out and say hi, which I'm like, I, I got to be doing that, you know, so it's something I learned from you. And um, tell me a little bit about that. So yeah, again, I think we're in the service, we're all in the service business, and we're all in the relationship business, right? Like, I've pinged you 20 times, no agenda, but I know maybe at some point, we will have a conversation and I can help you with something. Maybe, I, you know, a few weeks ago, I checked in with you to see how you were doing. And all of a sudden, I was hoping, yeah, build, you know, look at how you build landing pages. Um, right. And I learned something about that conversation. I think for me, I try to learn as much as possible. And whether that's talking to dealers, hearing their problems, seeing how I can help, or them coming to me, seeing how I can help them, I'm learning something. One fact that no one knows that I'll share here is that I knew that if we were going to be in the flooring industry, we had to be all in. We had to jump all in. I had to jump all in. I did not want to be looked at as the outsider, although I know I am. I wanted to like, I was willing to go as far as open a flooring store and let me just learn everything and just like figure it out so I can speak the same language. So what I did about a year ago was I took every single one of my personal friends off of Facebook. You'll see in Facebook, I friended almost every single dealer and flooring dealers and more and beat the box service groups. Oh. So when I go on Facebook now, I actually don't have any personal friends. I see everything that's going on in the flooring industry, basically on my home feed. And I'm in two groups or like whatever, maybe more, five or six groups, only flooring industry groups. So my Facebook has turned into like a flooring world, a flooring community. Wow. Um, so I don't get distractions of anything else. So I go on Facebook for business. I don't go on Facebook for pleasure. It's my LinkedIn. I've turned, I've turned it into my LinkedIn. Um, so if you've gotten a friend request from me, it's not because I'm being super weird or creepy. I'm trying to turn Facebook where I realize that most people are into my LinkedIn. When I post on my own Facebook, like my page, it's 99.9% .9 retailers commenting. <laughs> That's all I'm friends with at this point. Um, but I have gone all in on that. And I think that passion is what has made us successful. Our team is really passionate. And I, I think same with retailers. If you're really passionate about what you do, it rubs off on, on customers. My dad growing up would say something to me, most people just suck and it's easy to stand out, right? Just don't suck. And I've really taken that and said, wow, if you just like don't suck and you just respond and you're genuine and honest, like you'll probably win most of the time. But if you go even over the top, I mean, you'll propel yourself into you know a whole different category and that's what i've tried to stress our team to do and again i think retailers can do that consumers walk into 10 stores and get a shitty experience if you go above and beyond with that experience i mean your close rate will be through the roof compared to your competitors yeah you're capable of doing that look all things aren't equal in, in especially in this industry and when people are saying you know what about the price um, I have to charge more than a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Um, how do I overcome this? Well, if you think price is, is the buying criteria, you're dead in the water. I mean, you're, you're dead in the water. You, you can never compete on price and you'll never make good money, right? It'll just never happen. You need to win on service. You need to win on romanticizing the products and you got to win on trust, right? You got to build trust with that consumer who is going off the deep end, not knowing what she's buying and what it's going to look and if you're going to do it right. So let's see how off guard I catch you with this question. Oh God. You're going to open up a flooring store. What would you do? Well, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, let's start at the beginning. What would you do first? What kind of advice would you give what I call the goiks, the get off your knee people that, that, um, and a lot of these guys are, installers that decided to open a retail store and they know everything about the product and they know everything about an installation. They don't know much about hiring people or marketing or, you know, truly sales. So how, what advice would you give to those people? Let's start there. Yeah. Um, 
learn first learn on someone else's dime. If I really wanted to start another a business and I was an installer, um, I would probably go work as a salesperson at a flooring store for six months, three months, whatever it is, and understand what you're getting yourself into. And the only reason I say that, and it's a little bit um, contradictory of what I did, right? I went from Google to just like start a company in the wild, whatever, but I, we were lucky. We had venture capital money. I could spend someone else's money and learn on their dime. I wasn't losing my own money. If I truly was an installer and I wanted to open a store, the first thing I would do is I would spend three, six, nine, 12 months working at a store and understanding what you're getting yourself into, the pain points, the things that store does well, the things that store doesn't do well, because you can learn all of that on their dime. I mean, frankly, right? And get those experiences. What's brilliant is, is even if the store doesn't do it well, you're going to learn a lot because you're going to say, I'm going to do it differently when I open my store. My re only regret being at Google, and uh, it's funny, I talk about no regrets a lot, and that's kind of how we live our, our lives at Broadloom, but um, my only regret was not taking a second to look at Google and say, holy shit, this is a 60,000 person company that communicates well, operates well, drives profit, knows how to manage um, uh, levels and promotions and hiring, like operationally, that company runs, the scale is crazy right? Like how they do all of the salary adjustments and they do performance plans and they do hiring and they do training. Like that's something that I wish I appreciated more when I was there understanding the process they put in place. And I think I could have learned a lot more if I had opened my eyes about that. Um, but there was a lot of things I didn't like. Um, but I wish I could have come back a little bit more with open eyes. So I would suggest if you're an installer, go work at a store, three, six, nine, 12 months, who knows, you might be there for longer, but learn the things that you like, the things you don't like, so that you can prepare yourself going into opening a store and spending your own money. You know, it's, it's a much safer bet to do it that way. And you'll be ready to go day one rather than learn on your own dime for a year. All right. Give me a couple more. As an installer? No. Yeah. As somebody or opening starting my own their store, store um, you know, that, that first yeah. six months, what, what are you focused on? What are you, what's, what's going to build that? I always yeah. say you're in the foundational phase. It's really Im important to build a strong foundation. So what would you? Yeah, yeah, fair. So next thing I would do is I would find a way to own my backyard. Like you need to, I'm from Westfield, New Jersey. So I would open up a store, let's call it Westfield Flooring or whatever, Todd's Flooring. And I would find a way to get involved and entrenched in my community. So I am the go-to person in that local area, whether that's attending some meetings, giving back, whatever that is, I would want to find a way to get myself involved in the larger community. The second thing I would do, and we did this when we were a startup was, how do you look bigger and act bigger and put on a perception of you're bigger and more professional than maybe you really are at the time, right? So how do you become a thought leader and do things? That's having a great website. That's um, being great on social media, right? That's having a professional logo. That's having a clean showroom. How do you look like you've been there, done that? Not this is your first time doing it. And that's really, you know, something that you should think about from day one, because you can't change people's mind on you. They have a, you build a reputation from day one. So I would start to think about how I can look bigger and more professional online and in store uh, before even getting going. Even if you're just learning, like you don't want to give off that, that perception. The other thing I would do is I would challenge the status quo. I believe that the flooring industry has done things the same way over and over and over again. I think there are beautiful products in the flooring industry. I think there are some unbelievably beautiful products and stories that should be told, mm -hmm. but the retail experience is bad. I mean, I love our retailers, but if you look at, you're not, no one compares your experience to another retailer's experience. They're comparing your experience to how they buy mattresses, how they go on Amazon, how they buy anything else they do, order Ubers, right? That's the expectation that they want to have in your showroom. My belief is that I would have less dis displays and I would have, I would make the room feel bigger. Mm -hmm. I would organize it in a little bit different way and make, and I would make sure I understand why each brand I carry, what that story is, and why I decided to carry that in my limited collection, right? From retailers I've talked to that have less products, 
the consumer can make a faster decision and feels like you've curated all the best ones for them rather than just like, here's everything. Don't you want one? Right. Don't you want one of these? Yeah. Uh, so I would definitely design a showroom that is less is more curated just for my town and my area, or at least I'd give off that vibe that this is curated. I found the best for Westfield, New Jersey, and that's why I have these products. If I ever get, you know, really ill and I got a master class coming up, I'm going to have to have you teach it because it's I've like, never run a flooring store, so I could be. It's like, it's like talking to myself. Um, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, it, it, Disney, I love as a company. It's it's a good one to study. If you've ever studied or read books, uh, they, they talk about your who's your competition, and just like you said, your competition is everyone. They tell you you're going to compare the experience of uh, calling them to get a room with going out to dinner or getting tires. You know, yep. we compare experiences not within the same industry necessarily. So. 100%. And this goes back to how I would organize a showroom is like, I would take all the products in a certain price point in one corner, another price point, another corner, I'd have like the, you know, the super high end products all in a corner, I'd have the super uh, durable products in a corner, I'd have the design products in a corner in the last corner, I'd have, um, I'd have like the cheaper, slightly cheaper products for people on a budget. And when Mrs. Jones, just like I said to the beginning, when Mrs. Jones comes in, I'd qualify her, I'd just like I said, how we do sales. I want to know if they're a $1 million dealer, $5 million dealer, or $10 million dealer. And based on my understanding of who they are, right? So let's move this over to a consumer. I want to know if you have a $2 million home and you're looking for something absolutely stunning. If you're in a rental and you just want something that's going to work. If you have five kids and a dog and you need something really durable, or you're a designer and you want the highest design possible. I'm going to ask you a few questions. And then based on that, I would take you to that corner and feel confident that everything in that corner is gonna be roughly in your price point and what you're looking for. And I can romanticize all of those products. Now, when you go into retail showroom, I customer comes in, she's like, I think I want hardwood. Well, she doesn't know she wants hardwood or engineered wood or vinyl plank or lamb. And she actually has no idea, but you take over to hardwood and now you're showing her products. She pulls out the $20 square foot product and you haven't even asked her what her budget is. She fell in love with this $20 square foot product and you say, oh, what's your budget? And she says, $6. And now you're having to try to move her off of that to this other display that's $4 or $5 or $6. And now trying to tell a story of why you don't want that $20 product. You want this $6 and you've lost her. And you're running around the showroom trying to like find a good price point. So I would build the showroom differently based on personas, exactly how we build our sales team based on personas. Mm. Um, that is how I would do it, not based on feature. All right. That's good stuff. I'm, I would deviate from that as far as the price goes. Um, uh, Shaw did that turnstile based on, on price. And, you know, I, I would rather elevate the prices of all product and give a customer selection of these products. And it, cause I've also known and teach that the, you know, first of all, the budget is people really don't have a budget they don't come in with any kind of price in mind. And yep. when you start them off higher, they grab it, they, they move their budget up. You know, I, I see it happen all the time. Their budget's $2,000 and you're showing them something that's 4,500 and they say, well, I'm not going to spend any more than 3,200. Okay. <laughs> it just, they just all of a sudden move their budget up. Yeah. So, um, but it is, it is based on them and what they're looking for, not based on the product. Yep. So, uh, well, we, we touched on this a lot with, with what you just said. How would you do things differently if you owned a flooring business? Uh, and it's got to drive you nuts to work with a lot of the flooring dealers that, that, you know, just you're cringing because, and you know, it's maybe not your place to share with them, but how do you help these guys if, if you know you would do things differently? And you have you been in a showroom and you heard the sales presentation and you just, it makes you cringe. And yes, yeah, I mean, it has. And listen, I say this with a grain of salt. It's my feedback. I may be wrong. 
you could take your leave. Just like I said, work at a store and take your leave what you think is good. Take and leave anything. What I say, what you like and what you don't like. Like I, what I say is not the gospel, right? What you say is not the gospel, but take pieces of what I'm saying and take it and, and or don't. Um, we actually, I just got back this weekend. I can't say where I was, but um, we're doing a fun uh, little thing with, with Jason Gold. on Facebook. We all know you where you were. <laughs> All right. Well, I was, I was we all knew in, you were in Ohio with Jason. Yes. Um, you don't have to tell us what you were working on, but we all know where you were. Um, funny enough, I wasn't in Ohio. Oh, um, yeah. okay. So I threw well, you off snowing. Um, Wherever you were, it was cold. Yes. Uh, so anyway, John, Jason, and I really wanted, we talked about how can we do more to like be hands-on with retailers and really just give them as much feedback and help as we can. So um, we're filming this. We're, we're filming this little series of how we're going to a few retailers and getting hands on and helping them, whether that's with training or sales training or HR or operations or um, customer support. So we've actually gone to a few retailers thus far and we said, why not film it? So we filmed it and we have some pretty good footage coming up of Jason Goldberg trying to take a dealer that just started um, a showroom and try to implement Jason Goldberg's, you know, operations and my sales tactics and John's marketing tactics. Yeah. And it was pretty fun. Um, but outside of that, I mean, I just try to share anything that's on my mind in the groups and listen, I want to go back. This is partially why we launched this retail selling system is dealers were coming to us saying, Holy cow, my new website's amazing. Like this experience is great. Oh my God. The CRM is great. But hey, this doesn't match the great experience in my showroom. Can you help me figure out how to create that same user experience that I, like I do on my website and like I do with my CRM? Like, how do I create that same efficiency in my showroom? And after getting hundreds of dealers to ask that, that's why we kind of built that retail selling system as well. So I don't know. We do anything we can at this point to help the dealers succeed. If they succeed, we're going to succeed. Now, when I went in the showroom, I saw clearly right away the difference and uh you know, just in the signage and the presentation of the product was so much more consumer driven than it doesn't look like it was created by an old white engineer. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always joke about I went to the uh, buying group and everybody that came out was older and whiter than the person before them. And everything was so scientific, if you will, about how the product was made and, and just explanations were you know horrible i i am like i'm not going to tell this to my customer we're in a b2b industry so listen we have a very diverse team um i think that helps us but we are in a b our industry thinks we're in a b2b industry we're not we're in a b2c to b industry right there are beautiful products being made by these manufacturers and these stories need to be told about these products to a consumer the consumer does not care about the I'm going to make up words because I don't even know the rigid core, you know, aluminum oxide versus right. right. Something else. Like they just don't care. Like they expect when they go to a showroom, they're getting a good product, right? They don't need to know that one product is slightly better in 18 mil versus 19 mil. Most people don't care, right? If you're a commercial spot, fine, but they, they already expect that you're going to install it well. And it's a good product. Yeah, exactly. If they don't have that expectation, they shouldn't be shopping with you. Right. Exactly. So you have to get past that and you have to get them to fall in love with the story behind the product and the store, how it's going to make them feel in their home and how much they're going to love seeing it in their house. Exactly. The looks and the feel. I was, Mohawk came out with their new color wall and I've been very vocal about it that, you know, you, you've got an example of why your ugly beige carpet will outperform the ugly beige polyester carpet, you know, and on this display that they have, they have gorgeous samples, great colors, and there's nothing on there to say beautiful fall fashions of 2020 or, you know, there's no sex. There's, it's all why ours is stain resistant. And I've always argued, I have never had, I, I, when I started out this business, I had no flooring experience. So I would just listen to customers and I would never hear a customer come in saying, do you have a good stain resistant carpet? Nobody's looking for a stain resistant carpet. <laughs> if that's their buying criteria, they're going to go to a hard surface. Yeah, but no, it's interesting. Listen, Mohawk does obsessed that. with it. Yeah, and listen, they have beautiful products. I mean, you're not you're not wrong there. I'm curious though. You you mentioned you went to one of those buying group shows. Um, I really know very little about buying groups, uh, but I'm curious for you. Like, did you end up joining one or or 
Oh, right. okay, not it was, uh, Did you? I don't know. So it was a no brainer for us. We were absolutely going to join, flew out there to Florida, watched their presentation. They showed me the website and I was like, my website's better than that. You know, I'm looking for a faster way to get to 5 million a year at that time, you know, and that was my goal. So I'm looking for shortcuts. Um, so they show me their displays and I'm like, my displays look better than this. And then they, I asked them, do you guys have any good selling systems? Oh no, you can do it any way you want. <laughs> like, there's, there was no advantage. Now, I always recommend people should check out buying groups because for a lot of people, there is an advantage in that they will help you in areas that you're not good in, which is marketing and in some of the product stuff. That stuff I was already really good in. You know, I, I'm not a flooring guy. I'm a marketing guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same way. I mean, listen, I don't know all the buying groups, but I think Mo, I think, well, Carpet One, Abby, I think they do great things for, for dealers. And I think they've built a really awesome business, not for everyone, but just like you're a dealer, not for every customer. And I, we, we build software, not for every customer. Um, you just got to focus on what you're good at. So this is my philosophy. I teach this at the master classes that, you know, you are really in the marketing business. Your job is to attract customers, you know, and then and I've talked with Jason Goldberg about this and he really thinks that your job is more about selling. Um, but I think that's because Jason Goldberg's company does such a great job marketing that mm -hmm. they don't think that's a priority. But what this is where I saw the opportunity when I got into the flooring business is everybody sucked at marketing at that time. You know, this is seven years ago. This yep. is before Floor Force and Omnify, yep. which I think Omnify was brilliant. I mean, yep. they, the way that that was packaged and sold, and I'll never forget, I went to a, um, one of the, what do you call it? Road shows or something? Yeah. I went there in uh, the, the conferences and I was talking to this guy in the break room and he says, I'm not spending a thousand dollars a month or $12,000 a year on my website. You know, I said, dude, we're spending that every two months. We're spending 12 grand, you know, and we're a small company. And he's like, really? I said, yeah, this is a no brainer. You got to do that. I mean, how many people before you guys came along didn't have a website how or many still don't the have website, website didn't show up? Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Um, I'll tell you one of my biggest struggles here is like point blank. We make our money as a business, like all businesses make money, right? We make our money on non-website things. We believe that if you don't have a good website, doesn't matter. Digital advertising will never work. Your flooring software will never work. Your CRM will never work where we kind of make our money. Um, we keep our websites so inexpensive because we believe without the website, you will always, you'll fail. So we break even and a lot of times lose money on every given month with a website. What frustrates me is I'll talk to a dealer and he'll have this crazy website. And I'm like, how much are you paying for it? And he's like, ah, $1,400 a month. I'm like, where is that money go? Like, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Like, how do you not know where your money is going? Like, this is the most important thing to your, this is your online showroom, right? Like this is, this is just like your in-store showroom that you're proud of. This is your online showroom. People instead of walking, they're clicking. How is this not like so, so, so important to you? And I try to stress the importance of it, but there is just some people that will just spend way too much money and still not know what they're getting for it. Well, and I tell them, that it, how much time do you spend on PK sessions, product knowledge sessions? You've got the sales reps coming in, teaching you and your salespeople about the product. Okay, how many customers has that ever brought into you? You know, <laughs> none. And then how much time do you spend on your marketing? Again, without marketing, you don't have a business. Without, without customers, there is no business. And even when people will have a knee jerk reaction, let's say the economy starts to crash and starts going down, people's automatic knee jerk reaction is to lower their prices. Well, I always say, well, how, how does anybody know you lowered your prices without marketing? Lowering yep. your prices doesn't drive customers into your business. Yep. 
Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think marketing is a, is a huge portion of it. I think, um, listen, I, I think all those answers are right. Sales, marketing, and service are at the end of the day, the most important things to your business. Um, the PK sessions, although are good to have, like the consumer just really doesn't care the difference between aluminum oxide wear layer and a yeah. ceramic bead coating wear layer. I assume it's good. You want right. to hear something really pathetic? Sure. I still don't know the difference between WPC and SPC and I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. They've been explaining that to me for years and I could care less. You know, I, I keep explaining. I got three products, Revwood, Pergo Extreme, and um, uh, Carndine Coralock. All three are manufactured completely different. All three of them will be exactly the same consumer experience. Yep. <laughs> they all clean the same. They all scratch resistant. They, they're all the same. They're, they're what does it say? People shop by what? Color? Color and yeah. price? Looks. For number one? Looks. Prices are close enough that I charge the same amount for all three. Revwood's quite a bit cheaper, but uh, I can charge the same price for Rev Revwood that I can the other other two. You know, again, people get so hung up on prices as if the consumer knows walking in what the stuff costs. That's why they're freaking out when the prices go up and the shipping goes up, as if the consumer's going to know. They don't know that prices went up. All they care about is what's their project going to cost. Yep. Yep, and exactly. how soon can you get it done? I'll tell you, I was going to make a video about this today and I still might, but I'll, I'll share some insights I, I got from visiting this dealer was that the other thing I noticed is like, if someone it has, if you give someone a bid or, you know, an estimate and you don't hear from them, like you can't just give up, right? You were in their house, you measured, you should have probably closed in the house. That's the best mm -hmm. place to close. And after that, you need to give them a ring. So what I did is I, I took out like a stack of papers, which is a whole other story of their leads that they called dead, right? People they gave an estimate to in December. I called this first lady and I said, hey, I saw you. I, I just wanted to reach back out. I know you were interested in, um, I can't remember the product, but let's just call it um, Jerry Wood. <laughs> I know you're interested <laughs> in that Jerry Wood. I just wanted to check. We're actually ordering a truckload of it for a builder tomorrow. Um, or in the next two days, and I can probably get you on that truckload and get you builder pricing. Um, I know I haven't heard from you in a few days, in a month or two, but why don't you at least reach out? I can knock down the price like 10 or 15% and you can get it on top of the builder's truckload that I'm getting. He's putting it in some of the nicest homes. He ordered it for all these high rises. It's going to look beautiful, but just wanted to check in if that would be helpful to you. I called like six people, three sales. Wow. They're supposed to be dead. They're supposed to be dead, but all of a sudden they felt like they were getting a deal. They're like, oh, there's urgency. And they were like, wow, a builder is putting this in high rise homes and they're putting it all over the place. Like I picked out a beautiful color. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Three, three deals. That's fantastic. Did you, you called? Yeah. Hmm. That's fantastic. You know, I mean, we teach uh, the people a nine word email or nine word text. And that's because sometimes people don't answer the phone or, or respond to a long email. So just send them a text saying, are you still interested in flooring for your living room? And then people can respond right away. But yeah. It, my only, nope. my only, I agree that you should have all different types of communication. My only thing I don't like about that is, are you still interested? It's such an easy thing to ignore. Instead of if I say, hey, we're ordering a truck out of this for a builder that's putting this into a bunch of $2 million homes. I could put a little urgency there. Yeah. To me, that's, that's your first step. The, are you still interested in is something you do when they don't respond, they don't answer your call. Yeah. So I do the day you still uh, got to you give them a simple way to respond. I mean, there's no one answer. You do it all. Um, yep. You know, you send, you make the phone call, you send the email, you, you do the nine word text, you know, but always to me, it's a matter of respect. If you don't yep. respect yourself and your time, why should your customer? I mean, you've got to respect yourself enough to follow up. You gave them information. You gave a free in-home estimate. Respect yourself enough to follow up. They, you deserve an answer. Of course. I think my final, I've thought about if I had to make like a drip email campaign or a drip call script, my final one would be, listen, we spent a lot of time on this. I think this is going to look beautiful in your home. And installation pictures are really important to me in my business so I can show other customers what would it take to earn your business? I really want to show this off because I think it's going to look so beautiful and I really want to get this installed. Um, is there something it would take to, you know, actually have this installed because it would help me show this off and I want, really want to make your home look beautiful. 
that would be like my last send off email. But again, you have to try a variation of things like the, you know, there should be six or seven different types of messages out there and, and see what works. All right. You're giving me better content than I was hoping for. So um, <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> we weren't going to go about broad loom and floor force. No, listen, talk about uh, dealers. Let me, I, let me I even say that. Great Insight. That that I believe that being a thought leader, you end up selling yourself and your company. Um, on these posts, I hope people see. I rarely talk about broadly. Once in a while, there's something I need to promote. Our our town hall, like industry town hall, fine. But floor con maybe. But generally, like get yourself out there and be a thought leader, and people just respect you and trust you, and that's how you end up marketing and winning, right? You don't have to go out there and chant your business. So let me ask you this. How would you rate yourself as a leader? Out of 10? Well, out of 10 or just a story uh, or uh, what does leadership mean to you? Because uh, if you watch any show that, that like Bar Rescue, it's mm -hmm. always poor leadership. You know, that uh, the leader doesn't have the vision, doesn't share it with their employees. It, you can tell the reason that a business is failing is usually due to poor leadership. That's the number one reason why any business is going to fail. Yeah. And I think leadership is divided into like ownership, you know, authenticity, transparency, and um, motivation. Like there's different layers underneath leadership based on where I, I would say I'm about a seven, um, maybe a six, maybe a seven and a half where I think I can personally grow and where I know there's opportunity is, is kind of twofold. First of all, when I was just out of college, I thought I was the best leader ever. Right. Like, and then you become humble. Then you realize like you actually don't know anything. And <laughs> I'm now still only, you know, 31. I'm like, I, I still don't know. Everything. There's people that have done this for 20 years that know way, way more than I do. So like the fact is there's a ton, I don't know that I don't know. So I definitely can't, that already knocks two points off my score. Um, I would say on top of that, where I can be personally a better leader is I'm not the best, um, operator is not the right word, but I'm not the most organized and I'm not the most, the best operator. I think maybe operator is the, the right word. Like I consider Jason Goldberg to be the best operator in the flooring business. And I hope Jason doesn't take offense to what I'm about to say. Cause I think Jason is an unbelievable operator in business generally, like he could probably operate any business because he's really good at process. He's really good at um, scale. He's really good at just the operations part of it. Now, maybe where Jason isn't as good as whatever, sales and marketing, right? Or in um, getting people excited at his company. I don't know. I don't know how his company says, but for me, I know I'm really good at motivating my company. I'm really good at building a community, getting people excited, being authentic, uh, just being myself and trying to help. But where I could do a better job is helping operate and put down processes and put down procedures within our own company. I don't do a great job at that. But what I've learned the secret of any CEO or business owner is if you just surround yourself with good, really, really good people around you that are better at things than you are, mm -hmm. you can just be the, um, you know, you can just, you can watch the orchestra play and you can just sit there and, and let the, you know, MVPs play their music or do their jobs and you can just help, you know, be the conductor. Um, so my secret to business is hire really smart people around you that are better than you at the things you're not good at. Um, do you read any books? Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read books. I would say I am a skimmer. Like there's a lot of parts of the books that I just don't necessarily think I have to, I go through them quick. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a few of my favorites. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. I think The Everything Store about Jeff Bezos is an unbelievable book. Um, a book I'm reading right now is called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, it's written by Ben Horowitz, who is part of Andreessen Horowitz, probably the most famous venture capital fund in the country. And he's known as like probably one of the best business people ever to live. And the reason I like this book, again, it's technically for... He wrote it for the tech community, but there's so many parallels. Like anyone can read this book. He just says the things that other CEOs won't admit or say to themselves. Like we all know as an owner of business, you go on this roller coaster. 
and the, some days are great and some days are good. And he transparently talks about how to deal with that and how he deals with it. And he just says the hard things that no one wants to say, like firing people. Like we all want to pretend firing people is easy and we can just do it. But the truth is it's really hard, right? And it's taxing. And how do you do it the right way? And what does that mean? Um, we had a very good post in the flooring store owner group about that. Yeah, it's tough. Um, listen, during COVID, we laid off like 30 people. Um, we wow. had to, we didn't know what the future held. And it was my first time doing it. And I was like, it was really hard for the employees. And I don't want to down dismiss how hard it was to lose your job. But as a CEO, you don't talk about how hard that was for me. It was like, and I'm not looking for empathy or sympathy or whatever, but I had, leading up to that, I was like one of the hardest weeks I had and then actually doing it and doing it right. And knowing that no matter how well you do it, people are going to hate you and your scene's going to be caused is like, it's tough, right? How do you do that the right yeah. way? And most leaders don't want to admit negativity or things they don't want to do. They just want to say, I can do it and whatever, hold it inside. But that book really sheds a light on yeah, the hard thing about hard things. I really like uh, books and things that would, that show failures and, you know, like again, Disney filed bankruptcy 11 times or 12 times, um, you know, just to see people overcome the McDonald's story. And um, yep. I love stuff like that. Um, Chet Holmes, The Ultimate Sales Machine is one of my favorite books. Uh, he talks about pigheaded discipline and determination, which is uh, definitely something that Jason has and, and something I think you have too. Um, the emphasis I saw, I kind of passed this over with our leadership, uh, but when we were at FloorCon, there was just a really big emphasis, which wasn't planned, uh, but all the speakers, the big leaders like Jason and Nick Bach were talking about things ab about employees and how important the employees were. One of my favorite lines, a guy, Adam Witte said, your job is not to build a, a great company. Your job is to build people to build a great company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are your greatest asset. And if you were to look at your expenses, it's probably your largest expense is people. Again, like I, I'm in an easier position because I can just be the conductor, the orchestrator of the band, and I can just hire a really good drummer and a really good piano player like our executive team around me is much better at what they do than what I than I could do and it makes my job way easier um and if you think you're really if you could do everything well how do you teach how do you duplicate yourself or multiply yourself to get so many people and how do you train those people like training is so underrated I mean, most retailers don't have any training or any process of bringing someone on how what do you how are you going to get what you want to get them to do like we talk about that a lot of the master class, and it's uh, uh, especially I do a session at the end called Go the Goik session, um, and and place emphasis on the fact that look, you're going to hire people that aren't going to do as good a job as you, especially installers. You're going to have to learn how to deal with that. That I know you can do it yourself, and, and I know you can do it faster, and you can do it better but you're going to have to learn how to hire people to do things that you could do better yourself. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, yeah, I, I a hundred percent agree. I mean, training is so, so important. If you want to be able to scale your business, most people don't take it seriously. And, and I think that's a huge opportunity for the industry, honestly. And we show them what uh, happens a lot of times is when they, those people fail, especially with a customer, and you come in and save the day, that customer loves you even more. So don't have this fear of the customer will never use you again. Anytime you have a problem and you come in and fix it, that's a customer for life. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. I, I totally agree. So, well, this was a fantastic interview, Todd. So I appreciate you taking the time. Any last words you want to give the audience? You're about as accessible guy as there is. Um, yeah, listen, always reach out. I'm happy to you know, post my phone number, my email, but email todd.saunders, obviously at broadloom.com. I post it everywhere. Um, I would say the last thing that I just want to get out there is at our company, we are on a mission. I would say we are obsessed with our mission and it's, we believe that we could unite this industry and turn it into something much bigger and better than it is today. I think there's a misconception that we're trying to segment or tear this industry apart. I 
truly stay awake at night thinking, how can we build a platform that allows brands to tell their amazing stories about their amazing products and retailers the story of why consumers should shop there versus somewhere else. And if we don't all unite and think about that, I mean, I'll just be honest, the box stores are gonna win. They're gonna take over and we're all gonna be in a world of pain. So yeah, um, I mean, there's a handful of people that think it's an, an agenda driven that you're trying to sell websites and, and you guys are trying to make money. But the way you guys do that is by dealers succeeding. And I, I see everything you guys are doing is geared towards the dealer success. That's it. In multiple ways, you know, and you're looking beyond just the marketing. You're, you're trying to package that whole experience so the, so the dealer is more successful. That's all we want. Whatever the dealer wants us to do, we will do. If that means help clean up our website, help clean up our showroom, that means fly to help train. We will do whatever it takes to make sure the dealers can succeed and the brands can tell their stories about their beautiful products. I mean, like without the products, there is no dealer, right? Like I, I understand that, but there is no hidden agenda. If you think there's a hidden agenda, I welcome a conversation. I, I don't know, but uh, I know for you and guys like John, you guys all see opportunity for, for the dealers. You see how they can improve. I see that all the time. I, you know, and I, I love the feedback and the stories about how they sell or how they raise their prices or, you know, how their business is beyond control that <laughs> they're just doing fantastic. This was all about money for us. I promise you, we would run this business differently and we wouldn't have the people around the table. I mean, we've been really lucky to acquire role master and retail lead management and the CEOs there all joined us and, and creating your space, right. And floor for us and all these great companies. And they're all still here. And if this was just a money thing, you would see us buy these companies get rid of half the people, get rid of half our people, raise our prices, say, hey, you can't use our, you can't use Rollmaster unless you have a floor force website and just like act like that. That's not what we do at all. We believe that if the whole industry does better, we're just gonna end up doing better. Yeah, those moves you guys made were insane. They're not making your lives any easier. I guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but you know, if it was easy, I guess everyone would do it. it, it it's gonna pay off huge for everybody in, in, in a couple of years. And it, it just, it's going to take a little time for it all to come together and smooth out and go yep. through some bumps and, yep. but you got the, you assemble the team to do that. So and we won't be perfect, right? Well, there'll be, there'll be messages that say that we're doing something really bad. I'm sure. Um, but listen, we're trying to make sure at the time we, we do it right. Which live on the, uh, on the forum and people can see it and respond and and you yep. answer, you're transparent. Yep. And that's yeah, exactly. what I appreciate about you and, and uh, have enjoyed just watching your growth and everything you're doing throughout this industry. Well, I appreciate yeah. you as well. I mean, I listen, I think we all play our part in pushing the industry forward. So, yeah, yeah, for the benefit of the dealers, you know. Yep. Um, all right, I'm going to close this puppy up. So, thanks for joining the Flooring Business Podcast. And remember, if you're already in, sales training, just send me a message and we'll get you signed up if you're not in it yet. Uh, now, if you really want to grow your business fast, I also have the Flooring Business Accelerator Program. That's a six-month program where I'll work directly with you to grow your business and profits fast. You can contact me at jerry at profitnowwithjerry.com for more information. Thanks for joining us, Todd, and you guys have a great profitable week.